Well, hello there. Uh, my name is Paul John. I'm from Germany. I just gave a talk on Cisco NAC technology and uh, hacking Cisco NAC. The talk is uh, called NAC Attack um, at Black Hat Europe 2007. Um, and I will be telling you a bit about our work, what we did, how we approached it. It all started about a year ago. Um, a customer actually asked us to um, look into different NAC technologies and evaluate their uh, benefit for the company and so we started um, first of all with a paper evaluation and then started building labs and invited vendors um, and as a result we sort of uh, got stuck to uh, the Cisco NAC framework um, for some well, I guess obvious reasons because it's a market leader and uh, it's quite interesting stuff and so we built a Cisco NAC lab and evaluated the solution and while doing that we actually thought okay well how can you actually break it? Um, and uh, we did a security analysis of the Cisco NAC framework and we managed to break it. We were working exploit and we have more coming up uh, over the next few months. So before going into uh, the exploit details uh, or anything like that, I would like to tell you a bit about the technology so you understand what we are talking about. Um, with Cisco NAC framework, basically the idea is to have a sort of uh, admission control to the network based on uh, the compliance level of a client to a defined, um, well, let's call it security policy. Um, actually, the, the way it works is that um, when a client connects to the network, um, the network or a component on the network detects that there is a new client and queries the client for so-called post-track credentials. Post-track credentials are just information about the client, like a service pack level, installed operating system, if antivirus is up and running, if, if uh, antivirus dead files are up to date. Um, these are so-called post-track credentials. These post-track credentials are then transmitted to a back-end policy server in the Cisco NAC framework. This is the Cisco Secure ACS server. Um, where the information is then compared to the, po to the defined policy and depending on the outcome of that policy the system is assigned a so-called token which is a, it could be like something like healthy or quarantine or infected and depending on these tokens um, access restrictions are then implemented uh, for that specific client. With the Cisco NAC framework there are three different uh, variants um, in place um, which actually ch um, differ in the security they provide and also differ in the connecting vector of the client to the network. The first variant is a NAC layer 3 uh, IP uh, the connecting point to the network is a router. The um, enforcing mechanism uh, for access restrictions is IP access lists. The second uh, variant is NAC layer 2 IP. The enforcing point is a layer 3 switch. And again, enforcement is done through IP access list. And the third variant is called NAC layer 2 802.1x. Obviously, it's based on uh, .1x port control switch control mechanisms. Um, from a security point of view, they differ quite a lot. Uh, the first two have no means of authenticating the client, uh, whereas the third one, actually, there is a EAP fast uh, mechanism in place to authenticate the client. Now, let's talk about the security um, and um, do an analysis um, of the stuff that's going on. We have a client who wishes to access a network and um, the network wants to give access based on a policy. So now we need to get the information of the client and um, the client is actually asked to provide that information. Um, that in itself I believe to be a problem um, simply because you're asking an untrusted source about information which will then be used to give access to that source, um, in this case a client. Um, so how can you actually be sure that the information you get is valid, is true, um, and is not spoofed? Um, that is, I think, a big problem. And the second big problem is that there is no, in two out of three variants, there is no authentication of the client whatsoever. 
So if we take these two design flaws and simply add them up, um, you can, we can imagine a, uh, an attack vector which uh, we named uh, posture spoofing. We know it is possible um, to simply provide spoofed posture credential information to the backend server and therefore gain access. It works. We did it. Um, and how we did it will be told by Michael. Okay, hello. Hi, I'm Michael, Michael Tuman from the company ERNW. Uh, I'm the head of the research team and I gave a talk together with my colleague Draw about neck attack. I was focusing on um, the more practical stuff, so I did a lot of um, reverse engineering of this topic, um, of the software, especially of the Cisco Trust Agent. That's the client software Cisco provides for uh, the neck environment. And um, I want to, to show uh, how we did this approach and how we developed our posture spoofing plugins, that's uh, how we call it, and get you a little bit familiar with the techniques that were very useful to, um, to reach our target. Um, of course, one of the most important things was um, to read, as we call it, read the fucking manual and get the information um, that Cisco provides. Cisco is really good in documentation, yeah, so it was a good starting point for us. And we put that together with reverse engineering techniques, so we were disassembling all of the components of the Cisco Trust Agent, uh, looking at the assembler code, it's quite hard work to do it, reading assembler stuff, putting all the things together. And at least you can't figure out everything by just only reading assembler code. So um, we used other technologies like debugging, that's very common in reverse engineering too. And um, we had one special approach to do that um, with a tool called AutoDebug that's possible to monitor all uh, APIs that are called uh, under the Windows operating system. Very helpful to understand how the program flow uh, works, which functions are called. So we were able to um, look at specific functions in the code and understand how they worked, um, look at them in the debugger and uh, saw real life uh, data that was transmitted um, in the process of getting access to the network. And um, we figured out how the information we are putting together um, how the service pack is reported, how hot fixes that are installed are reported, or especially um, we took a look at Trend Micro uh, antivirus plugin for the CTA, um, which stuff is reported from the Trend Micro plugin, are the signature files up to date, and is the antivirus protection enabled? Yeah, and um, we are figuring out the format, uh, how the data is transmitted to the Cisco ACS, that what, was a quite challenging task to figure that out, but again, the manuals were very helpful and the Cisco log files, so we were able to do that and then we started to program our own plugins for the CTA. A plugin in the CTA is a software component um, that reports some information to the ACS, like antivirus information or OS information. Yeah, we knew how to um, to talk with the CTA directly and coded our own tool and we were able to replace it with the original one from Cisco. Yeah, so we were able to report any kind of information we want to. We did some um, funny tasks like um, reporting uh, Microsoft Service Pack 3 and 4 on the Windows XP operating system yeah, or reporting an um, installed and activated Trend Micro uh, Office Scan installation even without any Trend Micro part on um, the client installed. So it was quite fun and at least for us it was a proof of concept that all the stuff we talked about before is really working. Yeah, and if you're interested, please, please feel free to visit our website and download some kind of template um, to take a look at uh, this part of software. Um, it's located at www.ernw.de. Okay, thanks so much for listening and 